Okay, welcome everyone. Um, you're at the panel for IoT Data for Marketers. Uh, my name is Luke Grant. I'm your moderator today. I have a real affinity for the Internet of Things, uh, or IoT uh, as it's known. And the discussion focuses around leveraging all the data that comes with it for marketing purposes, obviously. And, uh, you know, we just want to try and provide uh, practical uh, tactics, advice, guidance, um, and, and ultimately actionable things that you can take away from here. So, uh, our first area is really just discussing best practices that businesses are using uh, with success in IoT data. Uh, Mark, let's start with you. Um, we'd spoken earlier about um, you uh, really focusing in on uh, planning ahead for the best use of, of big data. What exactly do you mean by that? Can you provide an example? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, one of the biggest things companies are struggling with right now when they start thinking about what IoT is, the, one of the preceding questions is really around big data. How are you going to handle all that information? Because it's going to be a lot. When you think about this, you know, smartwatch from Samsung that's reading my heart rate, you know, my oxygen level, everything else that I do consistently, well, that's information that's flowing somewhere. And so these companies that are doing these things at a consumer level, even if you think from a marketing pre-sale pre perspective, or you're doing something during sale, all that information has to live somewhere. Governance is a huge element in how you prepare for that data. Uh, and security is an ups big element around that. Imagine if some company or some hacker is tapping into this and reading all the information about our heart rate and oxygen levels. I mean, that's pretty personal information that can be sold somewhere. Many of these markets aren't even developed yet. Actually, mostly all these markets aren't being developed yet because it's so new. So when you think about the kind of data that you're trying to pull, it's all about the customer experience when you're thinking about your business with your customer. How are you going to evolve and create that customer experience that's going to drive whatever that is, whether it's pre-purchase to drive the purchase, or whether it's in the consumer good that they're going to utilize and create an attachment with you. Right, so as you know, people don't buy on logic, they buy on emotion, right? So how do you create an experience that's gonna drive that? That's really where you should start. There are lots of companies out there that just capture all their data, and they're trying to make sense of it. Much of it is unstructured data, which means companies don't know how to, um, how to formulate it correctly within their data structure, which makes it even more difficult to extract and analyze. So there's, there's uh, technologies out there like Hadoop and other big data uh, technology that helps reorganize this kind of, uh, this kind of information in an unstructured data pool, um, like social information, it's relatively unstructured. Uh, if you're trying to take sentiment information, if you're in the Hollywood business here, you're trying to understand what are people saying before the movie comes out, that's unstructured. If you think of um, stock market moves, a company out of Boston, about a year and a half ago was working on collecting all social information on the, on the uh, streams and matching that up with stock moves to see what kind of impact what someone's saying to stock move to change, right? That's huge, right? That's actually direct, directly impacting portfolios, dollars, everything, right? So this thing can lead in a lot of different directions. At the end of the day, we're talking about consumer-based type stuff that's about the customer experience. Think about what experience you want to do, what kind of human emotion you're trying to create. That's going to drive the data that you're trying to pull. Don't try to boil the ocean with capturing everything because it sounds cool in the beginning. Yeah. You know, don't you know? You, you have to eat an elephant one bite at a time here, right? So think about that experience, and that's going to help you drive that data. Well, just adding to that, um, I found it useful to just think of this as a continuum. You know, we shouldn't think of this as the IoT is something so new that. You know, we need some brand new techniques to think about. We've been on this continuum for a long time. All of us are walking around with a smartphone. If you're walking around with a smartphone, you're already part of IoT. Yeah. You know, because it's a sensor, it's capturing film, people are sharing films. That's how part of the data is getting created and it's becoming so huge. And we know that changes behavior and so forth, you know, in all kinds of odd ways and some good, some bad, some ugly. You know, so we know that this happens. So it's, it is a continuum. So I found it useful to think of kind of three dimensions of data. Have you heard about the three Bs of data? Volume, velocity, variety. And that's been, you know, kind of getting worse and worse or better and better depending on how you look at it over the history of computing. So IoT simply means more volume. So you're gonna have more and more sensors putting out more and more data, so you have more of it. Variety, 
all types of sensors that have to be integrated and the, the most important thing is velocity. If I can actually know what the sensor is telling me right now, I can react to that information faster. So what that means is, you know, this increases the scope and opportunity. So going to the best practices, some of the examples we've been use, using in our business is we, we have a retail partner where they are actually, they have beacons and sensors all over the store. It's a big store, like a car dealership kind of thing. And as people walk around, you kind of know where they're spending their time. What models are they looking at? If they have displays or kiosks, are people spending enough time there to engage? If there's a ticketing counter, are people spending too much time there, you know, and so forth. So by knowing where people are spending time, they are better able to distribute their service people or they can even be able to tell the customers walk on the premises, but for 20 minutes, nobody has attended to them, that kind of stuff. So there's more real data. The other thing is if you were in the session just before this one, they said, and I was startled by this, that it takes 22 contacts before a potential sale with the customer. Now, you're not going to be able to make all those 22 contacts at the website. So you need kind of a better understanding of your ecosystem and where the customer comes in. Going to point about, yeah, the whole experience thing. Where does your customer interface with your ecosystem? And the IoT enables you to gather data from all those points and maybe interact with that person and know. Joe who came into my service center <laughs> has now come into my website. Or Joe who's uh, at my website is now in my service room or in my showroom. This kind of information, I think, can be very useful, and that's what the IoT enables you to do. Yeah. So I see it more of a continuum than as something you know completely startling mm -hmm. new. Yeah, sensors and communication devices can really help with that attribution question. And um, in our prep uh, discussion, Chris, you were also talking about um, sensors and communication and what you termed as fast data. I thought that was really interesting, and is that basically what Tuami was just referring to, or do you have a, a take on it? <laughs> well, well, there's two ways to go about it, go about that. I, I just finished a discovery workshop with um, one of the largest facility management companies in the world. If you go to LAX, look at your ticket, that's the company. Um, they handle hospitals, military bases, all of that. And what he said was something that I'm going to put in my book that I'm working on, and, and he said, the real trick and the opportunity that everyone has here, um, if you don't have already a center of excellence, an IoT initiative going on, you are the, what he called the unencumbered, okay? What he meant by that was you have the ability not to have to deal with all the legacy systems that he has and the data and the politics and all of that. But he also slipped it on us, and it's gonna slightly disagree with what you're saying here. He said, don't try to uh, ask a question and then find the data, okay? Because you're going to be biased by the data that you find to solve the question that you have. The flip is, know what experience, and, and I deal with retailers all the time, um, know who owns the digital experience first in those retail situations, okay? Because the data is already there. So what you really need to do is to say, how do I want to improve the digital experience? Okay, that doesn't sound like IoT, but it really is. Because the flip side of that is, okay, start bringing in all that data. There are tons of people, this individual here, Oracle, uh, Mark as well, they're gonna help you sort through that data, okay? They're gonna help you find the patterns in there. Don't try to ask the question and then pull the data. Take as much data in, because there's really cheap ways of storing all that data, okay? So don't feel that's a limitation, right? So first, realize that you're unencumbered. Second, don't try to find the data, bring in all the data, okay? And then let experts find that. The mistake that I deal with many times when we were talking about is that sometimes there are quick wins because there are solution companies that'll say, we'll put in the beacons, we'll give you the analytics, and we'll solve it and target those individuals. The problem with that, we talked about this on a pre-call, pre is you don't own the algorithm. Okay, so that searching part, that, that searching part of the patterns you're trying to find, you need to own that. So as a best practice to follow it up, you need to own the algorithm. Don't worry about asking the question or finding a data set. Find out how many sources of data you have. It's absolutely right. Everybody who's got a smartphone now has a gateway, and that gateway can feed any IoT cloud system. And then you have to go through the homework of working with specialists to find those patterns. And then, once you have those patterns, you own the algorithm of those types of customer <coughs> triggers, and that's where you act from a marketing standpoint. So instead of pushing 
Um, and I deal with this all the time. People with mobile devices, uh, retailers, or um, to serve back in goods, whatever relationship they're building, through social or whatever, they use push notifications based on, it's fall, we have a deal, push it out. As opposed to, they have a wearable, they've done 20 sit-ups, here's the reward, there's the coupon, right? Attaching it to that data, and that comes from finding those patterns. Mark, do you have a quick comment, uh, then we're gonna move yeah, on. Yeah, no, I think that's right. So let's, when we look about, when we think about how the wearable IoT impacts data and you know, you're worried, like some of these consulting companies, including our own, what we'll do is we'll go out and ask the client, hey, give us all of your customer data. We're gonna sift through and come up with some kind of, I mean, it's really machine learning, we're gonna come up with some kind of algorithm that'll help you understand where the things that are causation, what are the things that are correlated. And really, I think that's the part where, where you're kind of alluding to, is like there's massive information. If you knew right away what's, what's the trigger, you wouldn't really need big data, because you know it, but you know, we're all human and we don't know how people really react. So. The machine learning part of it is really around predictive analytics and even getting into prescriptive analytics. So yes, in that realm, take all that information in. I mean, some of the largest consulting companies download terabytes of data, join them in the cloud and say, okay, great, where are these insights and how do we help you? Um, when you're getting into the serving a device like this, there's some cost impact. So you're gonna be limited, I think, in some of the areas that you can provide as an IoT particular device, right? That's to create the experience. Before that, you have to actually have to know what that limitation is and where those algorithms lie. And that is your competency. That is your competitive advantage. Great. Can I just add one uh, small element to that, which I think is worth uh, repeating because it's so important. When it comes to any analytics, and we work with a lot of companies where they expect us as data experts to tell them something about their business. And that's just not the way it works. You know, the person in the business you know, kind of the trenches, they should know their business. What we as technical people can do is kind of translate their insights into the appropriate, you know, pattern recognition things so that the tedious part, that you know, it's really hard to tell when these things are going on in the data, we can make, bring that out. But the nuggets are usually things, you know, if you have a nose for your business, how to run it, those insights are what's important. And that is proprietary. That's what he was saying. All the algorithm is saying, that's proprietary. We can't tell you how to run your business. How you run your business, that's you. That's your special, you know, you were put on this earth for that. So the, the point is, right, we can bring that out through the technical methods that we have. Oh, you, you want to know that kind of information. We can apply this type of technical method to pull it out of the data. So the data doesn't have anything, uh, you know, that, that we know about that you don't. All we can tell you is how to get that get that out using the algorithms that are generic, but the proprietary part is what you bring to the table. Thank God, there's still a role for marketers. Um, so segueing into you know kind of where's the future going with IoT data? I think we've already started touching on it as a continuum, as you said, Swami. Um, uh, you also said in our pre comments that you know we have lots of data. Obviously, it creates lots of opportunities. Um, what, what specific opportunities are you, you mentioned a couple. One that I think about that I think is interesting is this whole di idea of algorithm, algorithmically driven persuasive technology. Um, do you have any examples like that or can you count in on like persuasive technology? Uh, in, in our world it comes down to, you know, the only place where we've done that sort of thing, it comes down to the retail applications that we do. And there, basically, the, the you know this is a, like a major auto manufacturer, and so they were you know they had a scattered kind of ecosystem. You know they had one part doing the service stuff, and one part doing the the sales, and the other part doing the website and so forth. And what we were able to do is go if you can integrate these worlds and using IoT in specific areas as applicable, we were able to bring the opportunity to them. Essentially, we are doing a kind of persuasion because wherever they are, you get a comforting feeling. Okay, you know, now they call the service department from a distressed situation you know, on, on the road somewhere, and you go, oh, you have a problem with our car, now you, you know, we'll just send the service uh, technician, but then you also, at that point, engage them, give them a coupon to suit their feelings or whatever. You know, that sort of stuff is now possible because you, you right away are able to see the person throughout the ecosystem, and so you can connect all the dots and do it better. Okay. Great. Chris, uh, you, you mentioned something uh, that I thought was interesting. I'd love you to expand on it. You said that iBeacons 
are entering the trough of disillusionment. Can you explain what yeah. you mean by that? Yeah, so what I, what I meant by that was, in talking to companies, they're realizing, as an example, um, companies in typical hype cycles will run out, some of them will, will run out, and throw a bunch of iBeacons. So these are little beacons, they're battery operated, they put them all around the retail or an airport, and then we show up as consultants, and we, you know, we find the data silos and the skeletons in the closet, and they, there is no schematic of where all these beacons are. They don't know if they're on, they don't know if they're off, the batteries may have worn out. They have to actually send people wandering around buildings to actually find them, okay? And when you send an ID, then there's a certain signal that it gives out, and you've got to now trace that and work, it, work your way back to figure out what exactly does that mean and, and how did they set it up. Now, it can be done, and there are sniffers and all the little things that sniff that. What we're seeing is, is that, and I can, I don't think this is proprietary. The companies that make your light bulbs, they're going to be the ones that are going to be bringing it out. They're going to be uh, uh, instantiating those, those types of things because they're plugged in. <laughs> they're always going to be on. Um, and they don't want to be left out in the IoT uh, universe. So in talking to um, factories, mass retailers, uh, um, entertainment parks, things of that nature, the signals are going to be coming from your light bulbs. <coughs> they will be using Bluetooth and iBeacon type of technology, but the, the stone little cute little things you see on websites or the banner ads you see on the side, you know, um, the cute little things, that's gone because it's totally, it's unmanageable. I mean, what are you going to do, wander around if you've got 5,000 stores and check where all those beacons are and then who's going to actually put the battery back in and who's checking the battery and how do they know when it's not the signal's any good? So that's what I meant by that yeah. uh, in terms of that trough of disillusionment. Now that said, signals and beacons and the ability to pick up all that information, not going anywhere. That's going to continue, continue uh, accelerating. It's just not going to be by the same players. The big guys are stepping in. Yeah, I think your point about smart light bulbs is actually really interesting. I think it's going to be a huge part of IoT and it's gonna have surprising implications for marketers just because uh, you know light bulbs are everywhere, the system is always being maintained, and the data that they can provide, it can really <clears throat> give insights into how people live their lives. You know, how late do you stay up at night? You know, when are you home, when are you not home? And you can start to uh, you know, drive real time data and, and, and curate products and services around that. So. Yeah, I, I kind of think that there's, a, there's an opportunity here for creative marketing people to think of if you could see the customer's behavior across a more broad range of situations. I mean, I remember the first time I went into a restroom somewhere in, in America, you know, and I looked up and there was a newspaper there. And I'm going, oh, but somebody thought of this. I mean, here, here, here. When you know men do it standing up, and so you know we're, we're there, and there's there's a there's an area I'm looking looking at, and you know it's advertising to me, and I'm I'm not going anywhere for a few minutes, so you know I had to read it, and, and I thought about that and said, well, oh, you, you know somebody thought of this, and then so they you know for a couple of minutes they're able to get me to read something, and as you know you know everybody uh, getting their attention for two minutes is not that easy. So now, supposing you have all, this, all these areas where you can kind of engage an individual and you're getting information from them, how would you A, integrate that information and how B, could you act on it? And what are those places? So I think that's an important area for marketing people to think about because you have more information about more people in more interesting situations than you ever did before. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about tools and systems that assist you as marketers in making sense of all this big data that's coming in. Mark, um, you were just telling me before the panel here that um, you know, you're know you working with uh, a tool, a company called Humanize, which I think came out of the MIT Media Lab. Can you talk about that a little bit then, as, as a tool? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, when you're thinking about pre-sale and even post-sale, I mean, the objective for being a marketing consultant, the objective of getting a customer through the life cycle is going through that life cycle, being a customer, and then getting them to be a shorter life cycle as a loyal customer, and then becoming an influencer. Right? That's essentially what we're trying to do in the marketing world. And so when you think about that, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can do customer journey maps, you can do life stages, you can do buying personas, all these different ways of categorizing customers where they should live in that cycle, right? And how that should be affected. 
IoT is a big, it gives you a big capability in doing that and knowing where someone is in that life cycle to know what to promote to them next, what to say next to either keep them as a customer or refrain or, uh, or keep them from leaving the retention part of it, right? And so those are big areas. That's that, that, if I was going to boil it down, that's where IoT, from a pre-sales perspective, can really help, right? On this topic of human eyes, this is a company um, that started up in Cambridge. The owner, the, well, the founder, um, Ben, wow, ben uh, sorry, Ben Weber. He's one of the founders. The other founder is Sandy Pentland. Sandy Pentland is the um, he runs the media center for MIT. Um, he and Ben wrote a book called People Analytics. You should pick it up. It's pretty interesting. A lot of information. So they started this company called Human Eyes. It's kind of funny. They actually wrote the book literally about people analytics, right? So um, this company, what they did is that they created these little tags. You know, when you go to work, you usually have an ID, right? You put it around your, your neck or you got it right here or something like that. Now it's a lot smaller. But what they do is that they track people's movement, who they talk to, how do they talk to them, not necessarily what they're saying, but how they're saying it, <clears throat> speed, tone, listening versus talking, all that kind of stuff. Sounds intrusive, but it's actually pretty cool. One of the big <laughs> consulting companies. <laughs> At first I was like, wow, okay, where are we going with this? Deloitte bought into it, right? And what they, were, what they found was that they can actually tell what kind of salespeople are the best salespeople. That's super scary. Yeah. It's cool as long as it's not you being monitored. Yeah. <laughs> their idea was, well, we could show companies how to look at their, their top performers and how to get people who are not the top performers to become top performers. And it's working. Okay. It's amazing. We'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in yeah. a couple of minutes, but it's interesting. So an I mean, an application around that is what we went to next and started talking to an architectural company. And said, well, wait a minute, you're going to build a building based on a client who thinks they know what their interactions are. Wouldn't it be interesting to understand what the interactions are before you build a building? And that's a new service for them, right? So if you think of a biopharmaceutical company, where do people bump in the most? Who talks in meetings the most? Who's quiet and not adding value the most? How do you get them to encourage them to do things differently? All these different things are coming up because of the Internet of Things and the ability to figure out what people are doing. Now, the interesting thing is that this creepiness factor, you know, I think creepy is a factor of time. As time goes on, once something was, is like developed and like, oh, that's creepy, just a matter of time. Next thing you know, everyone's going to be telling you where they left, did they leave their house, where are they at now, all these other things that everyone now thinks is okay. Foursquare, right? And location on Facebook and all these other things. There is a sense around the emotional part from a human perspective that has to evolve along with it. I'm sure when these things came out, people were like, eh, I don't really know what's going to happen there. You always have the visionary folks, you've got the, you know, you've got the early divers, you've got the main, you know, mainstream, you've got your, you know, protagonists, right? So where do you fit in that cycle? How comfortable do your customers feel about IoT? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to map it to a customer journey map? Are you going to map it to personas? How are you going to deliver that experience? That was just one. Fantastic. Swami, so, mean, um, can you talk a little bit about your proprietary tool at CS3? Yeah, I mean, uh, our is a rule-based uh, engine. You know, I don't want to wow you with all the technical features, but from a user's perspective, it just basically interfaces between all the data you have and kind of the business users and gives the business users a way to say, I want to pull this kind of information from here, this information from here, this information from here, generate a little dashboard for me, and you know, do it very flexibly, and then say, you know, I want to watch that. I want to watch it change, so that basically when it changes, you can react in various ways. So we essentially live in the ecosystem between the data, you know, the data sources, Sometimes we work with the platforms. I mean, they, they make a platform, Intel makes a platform. You know, pretty much every big company seems to have an IoT platform. And it is complicated to navigate through that space. So one of the ways we add value to customers is by sitting with them and saying, well, you know, each customer is different. Some are small companies, some are big companies. So we like to kind of sit with them and say, what tools should you choose? What kind of data are you dealing with? And again, what is the opportunity? This should be treated like any other tool rollout 
You <laughs> kind of have to know how much value can you squeeze out of the IoT world. Is this something you should just learn about, or is this something you should really be deploying? And if you're going to deploy, deploy, are you going to just tip your you know toes in the pool? Are you going to dive in? Are you going to dive in the shallow end? The deep end, you get the idea. I mean, basically, you have to figure out how deeply you want to get in, because you can really get into it very deeply. So our tool helps you to add value uh, by essentially operationalizing all the complex patterns and data that you know that might help you run your business better. It's fantastic, and um, <clears throat> I think we've sort of brought up different examples and case studies uh, throughout the discussion. But um, you know, we're gonna I'm gonna press on a couple of, uh, examples here. Chris, um, you had pointed to a Forrester article um, that you thought was interesting that basically talked about some of the top emerging technologies to, to come in the next year or yep. two. Um, do you want to highlight? Anything from that article in terms of a, a case study where this, you know, IoT data is really being used effectively? Uh, yeah, what I would say is from a high level, um, and then I'll talk if I have time. I don't want to take too much of my uh, the time with the panel. Is that what we're seeing is um, something that I consider quite revolutionary, and that um, it goes all the way from the IoT all the way back to the enterprise. So. Um, I use a phrase a lot called a, a Velcro organization, right? The ability to snap pieces together very rapidly. So the trends that Forrester is talking about and that I think Oracle's trying to either lead or, or, or stay at the forefront is the ability to take your supply chain. And, and Oracle has sexy stuff, okay? And then we've got the not so sexy stuff that still runs companies, right? The JDEs the e-business, the Siebel databases, all of that stuff. But we've also got more sexy stuff, the Eloqua and all those capabilities. So one use case that we've done is with Manchester Airport. Okay, This is a marketing solution, right? So airports are now malls, right? They, they used to be just get you there, right? But now they're malls. And so as a mall, they want to be a platform. And as a platform, they want to enable their stores um, and their service providers to be able to target customers. And to do that, they want to make sure that all that data is there. So what Oracle has been doing is, um, with Manchester, is to enable them to take the back-end connection, let's say <coughs> supplies, or let's say certain products, and drag <coughs> and drop all the way to bots so that you can create a mobile application. You go, hey, I'm running late. Um, I need something to eat, okay? And because you have text-to-speech, it gives it to the bot. The bot then infers using AI. It now knows where you are in that airport, okay, and your preferences, and then sends you uh, a bunch of uh, responses in the text message that says, oh, well, you could try a salad here. You could try this. And oh, by the way, because the airport wants to make money, I'm going to throw in a coupon from the guys who I'm working with for a, uh, uh, for a pizza. And that's what they're doing. So they're taking all that information, okay, location data, all right, um, sales data, uh, uh, um, the ability to um, organize and taking that information from uh, the multiple retailers that they're managing and providing that platform. So in terms of Manchester Airport, we showed that off at Oracle Open World, in which now you can take all that information, where they're coming, where they're going, um, where they're about to board, and pull in all that information and then give them directed cues take advantage of that, right? As Because they downloaded the Manchester Airport app, right? It's pretty cool real-time stuff. Of course, the flip side of that is concerns over privacy, security. You know, you hear these stories about, you know, the Internet of Things could be hacked, uh, smart cars getting hacked, I think they have been. Um, Swami, do you have any case studies or kind of tales, cautionary tales, I guess, of, um, you know, concerns around security, privacy, you know, with this kind of data and using this kind of data. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, along with potential and convenience, always comes security problems. I mean, you always have to be worried about that. Uh, it, you know, pretty much any place where you try to optimize some process, make it easier. Right? I mean, think about the airports. It's extremely inconvenient. I don't know how secure it is, but it's extremely inconvenient. All of us can agree to that, right? But I can make it really convenient by letting everybody just board as they want to without checking the bags. And we know that that doesn't work so well. 
So, you know, the whole point is, right, wherever you you compromise a little bit for convenience, you tend to have insecurity. So with IoT, the dangers are more. So if you think about the internet as already a somewhat unsafe place, IoT doesn't make that, doesn't make security any easier. Think about it like this, right? You're going to be responding to some sensor telling you some information. How easy is that to hack? Not that hard. I mean, think about, you know, if, if you respond every time your refrigerator temperature drops, right? And I just lie to you, find a way to, to tell you that the temperature is so and so, or the refrigerator is broken or whatever, you can easily overreact to that information. Having a lot of information that you can base your decisions on can make you effective if you've thought through other issues like security and so on. But if you can't rely on the information, I don't care how much information you have, it's not very useful. So security has to be talked about as an architectural principle in the IoT world from the start. Because if you can't trust the data, it doesn't matter volume, velocity, none of that matters if it's not secure. If the data is not true, it's, it doesn't matter. So security is key. And also has to be considered as a marketer when you're designing a campaign around this, when you're reaching out to engage with your customers or you know, try and you know, set up some new touch points or create real-time offers, um, how is it gonna reflect on your brand if they sort of take you know, using this data the wrong way? So there's the security element, there's the, the privacy element, and then there's kind of the branding and marketing element. Um, Okay, let's, let's wrap up uh, quickly before and then we'll leave some time to get the questions. Uh, just want to go down the, the, the panel in terms of advice. Um, we've gotten a lot of great insight here today. Uh, nuggets of advice that you give to marketers. Um, and if we can just kind of do one minute each, starting with Mark, you mentioned really study your customer behavior um, in order to leapfrog your competitors. Yeah, in a very distilled short sentence, that's kind of what we try to do, right? Um, I, I think when we start dealing with IoT, in particular, and big data, you know, if you're new, talk, start talking to consultants. These are some of the things that we do. Um, there's a lot of different activities going all across the country, all across the world, in terms of how they're using this kind of technology to improve, you know, things other than just dollars, right? How to improve lives, how to improve experiences, how to improve you know, um, the natural resources using windmills and, and hot water tan. And it's, it's really crazy out there. There's so much, that, there's so much you can do. Um, consultants like us, we really love, we love doing this kind of stuff. So getting our hands in different organizations trying to figure out and help you guys are some of the key elements. So um, take a look at what you're trying to do, what needles you're trying to move and start talking to people around what different systems are out there. The other part of it too is that you can monetize this data, right? Whenever you start looking at IoT, um, there's a part of the whole process which, just like in a car engine, you end up with exhaust, stuff that you don't need. However, that data, people need it. You should probably don't know who. So that's called exhausted data. These are some of the things that we help customers understand. First, what is that customer journey? Where are the customers? Um, what kind of tools and IoT and behaviors that are needed to help you evolve the sale or build a product for, right? And then what are the different things you can monetize after the fact and perhaps build another part of your business? Thanks. Swami, you basically said that there's no time to waste in terms of getting up the learning curve on IoT data for, for marketing, kind of an adapt or die <laughs> bit of advice. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say adapt or die, but I'm, the, 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 <laughs> that seems a little drastic, but uh, even if I say it. Uh, so the point I, I would say is that you, it's better for you to learn faster. You know, learn anything as soon as possible. I mean, learning never hurts, right? I mean, you, you can always take it or leave it. Someone once said, uh, you know, when you learn, you might still run away, but you'll run away with confidence. And so the point is, right, it's important to have confidence in whatever decision you make and knowledge will bring that. So uh, the, the main thing I need the marketing type of people to understand is, right, all your information is, I mean, all your decisions are based on data. The question is, right, if you think, my, if I only I had this data, my, da my decisions would be better, there's probably a way to get it. You know, one of the reasons IoT is such a big deal these days is sensors are really cheap. You, know, you can put sensors all over the place, you can get information all over the place. So if you're, you know, if you get an ingenious idea, if only I have this type of data, something you know, might help my decision, that's one area where you can get help. 
if, if you think, man, if I could only tell whether this is going on in the data that I already have, you can get help there as well. So it really comes down to you kind of boring into, you know, what kind of data could improve your business, what patterns of data would be useful to detect, and that sort of stuff. And once you have that and start learning that, I think the technology part, people like us can help you uh, with, with that journey. But the data journey is something that I think you should start learning about. Where's the nuggets of data in your business? What would help you? And how can you, uh, you know, how can you optimize your business processes based on that? Yeah. And I think it goes without saying that the Internet of Things is not going away. Yeah. The idea of the big data that it generates is not going away, so it's not something you can kind of run away and hide from or, or be in denial about. Uh, Chris, uh, you, uh, your, your advice centered around really work on developing artificial intelligence um, and kind of knowing your customer, using it to know your customer better, using algorithms. Can you touch on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, there, we're entering into an era in which we're going to have algorithm markets, okay? And they're already out there which you can actually take certain rules and just apply them to your data, okay? That's not future, there are actual algorithm markets, all right? So, from a marketing standpoint, you've made the first step, okay, you're here, you're, you're, you're listening to something. Understand that uh, IoT is your bridge between the real world uh, of what that person or consumer is doing and that digital world online. So the first thing you must do is, I, and, I, and I said this earlier, is you have to own the experience, right? What is that digital experience in the real world? And how do you want to shape, nudge, or move that in either direction, okay? Once you own that, then internally you're gonna have to get the poets, the marketers, and your quants together in the same room. And they're gonna help you in terms of taking the next steps of bringing in all that data, okay? Mm -hmm. The next thing is, while it may be tempting, okay, to um, uh, use uh, to bring in a third party, and uh, I've had examples in which a company brings in a company, won't name their name, but they're very close to this area. They'll put in beacons, but they'll then design the actual algorithm to trigger based on the behaviors that are happening inside a specific location or store, okay. And then they'll send messages, and you don't have to actually even look at the data. You, you'll see reports, but you won't actually understand what those behaviors were. Okay? The upside is it costs you very little. The downside is they now know how your customers work. And they are not going to sit there and not call up the next company just like yours <laughs> and say, I know how that works. And I can give you examples, you don't have time, but examples of competitors that said, hey, I could just use these guys. And I said, I really think you should invest in understanding your algorithm. And they go, ah, but these guys are free, whatever. And then in the end, three months later, their competitor was on tour promoting <laughs> that capability, okay? That exactly shows how their customer works with their competitor. So, the steps you have to do is, and I think we've all resonated it uh, numerous times, is to really, it really start taking those steps to say, I'm going to own the experience, and that experience is going to be defined by what I am now going to observe from all the data coming in, okay? And then learn from there to design those patterns and take action. Great. Thanks, guys. I think that will really help us move the needle as marketers. Um, We've got some time for questions. Um, yes, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I want to ask Mark, because uh, my company is VR Video, and you mentioned <coughs> the architectural um, walkthrough before it's actually built. And I was curious, like how, like, how would that work? Would you part, if you were to partner with the company, would you supply like the CAD CAM design uh, that the architect has built, and then design something like the walkthrough from that? Or how would you create that space, the volume for that? That's actually a pretty interesting idea. It's not 100% what I meant out of that, but um, just to kind of... <laughs> my name, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that was, I think that was pretty cool. Um, you, can, you can do that with Revit or, you know, 3D Studio Viz or whatever you're using over there to kind of walk through. But um, using uh, VR, AR, uh, are, are you in the architectural world? My brother is, but I, I'm more just VR. Pretty much. Okay. You do for, for studios, more entertainment oriented, but we want to get more just practical uses of VR. Mm -hmm. 
So VR being virtual reality, you're closed off from the existing reality. Um, AR being augmented reality, you're adding a digital layer on top of the physical reality, right? So um, wearing something like the Microsoft HoloLens, you're able to see this desk and you can put something digital on top of the desk. You can put a TV on the wall, right? The digital TV, you'll see it, <laughs> take off the glass, it's not there. But in terms of the building, um, what this company, Humanize, was doing was figuring out where people were, where people walk, where they, um, uh, where's the, where are the virtual water coolers? Who connects together the most? Who doesn't? Who should? Does engineering, should engineering connect more with the project managers? Uh, you know, how does that all work in their organization? And by understanding that, they can have some real input in the design aspect of you know, the building, the floor plan, right? So that's kind of where I was going. It's kind of interesting that you were talking about how do you take these drawings and then populate that up into um, into a, a, a built virtual a building. Yeah. yeah, they have that today where you can walk through and look at clash detection and that sort of thing. So I don't think it's highly rendered, although you can, it just takes a lot of processing power. I mean, I've seen like the Avatar room, you know, James Stan worked on it, it's like smaller than this room. And so to have an experience in actually building a giant volume, so I don't know how that would work or if that even exists at that size, but. Yeah, no, a great, um, another great scale example of that is JPL. <laughs> so they used, um, HoloLens to create, the, you know, Mars, a big piece of Mars, and so they had like a studio, a big warehouse, and they recreated it. So you, you have to incorporate space as well, right? Um, but there's pretty interesting things that the people do, you know, people are doing today in terms of hey, how do you go up elevation? How are you walking in different, you know, different areas? Let me just add real quickly. You should. Uh, I'll do a side, but talk to manufacturers. We, we deal with manufacturers all the time that are doing heavy duty machinery, and those machines are doing different actions. And for us to be able to have an interface that says, well, okay, this system is offline, or this system is acting in a certain way. So if you had a cat, we were able to take, because we've done this before, we've taken a cat of, of, a, of a specific manufacturing device and then shown how that manufacturing device is not working correctly and then be able to push that to the field service rep mm -hmm. and say okay here's the device now you need to work on it okay um, and then be able to signify or, or identify certain areas or sensors within that CAD uh, 3D drawing I can tell you right now there are major manufacturers that would love to be able to have that visible visibility and have it connected to some kind of IoT sensor. Uh, I can put you in touch with a company called Turbine, T -E -R -B -I -N -E. mm -hmm. uh, that was a I know the CEO of the company, they are collecting internet, uh, IoT type of data from all sorts of places to drive virtual reality stuff, so you may be interested in that. And uh, Autodesk too, so if you're thinking of the connection of, um, if you're thinking of uh, industrial uses, they have Inventor that'll, that manages the drawings into the virtual reality, um, but on the building side, they've got the construction and the AEC group that is also doing a lot of this stuff, so you might want to connect with those guys. But they're working on Oculus. And if we call it the three Vs, those three dimensions are the primary ones, or are there other ones like a multitude of dimensions? Uh, you know, but once you do three Vs, others, they get competitive. They want to add four and five and so on. I've seen veracity, sure. value. But, but to yeah. uh, so, but, but the, these are the three, you know, there was some fame. This is not mine. This is, uh, you know, there's been some, some people who have analyzed these things, and they came out with the three Vs. So, for a, for a general audience, immediately you're able to see what we are talking about when we say this is a continuum. It's been changing since computing got invented. Excellent. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Sir. Two of them. Uh, and Swami, you spoke about data from sensors, uh, but there's a lot of other data as well. So we discussed about social media, we discussed about data lying in different other sources. So how truthful is this data when, when you actually get to analyzing it and when you come up with, uh, you know, with analytics around it? What is your experience? That's my first question. And uh, second is, uh, while we've been speaking about this, we've mostly spoken about uh, business to consumer, uh, retail, etc. But don't you think that the uptake is more on the B2B side, uh, where you can talk about industrial, IoT, and uh, you know, healthcare? Let, let, let me take the second question first. B2B is a major area of focus for us. I mean, the only place where we reach customers is through our partners. 
uh, the only place where we reach customers is through our partners. You know? So we don't really reach to consumers directly, but B2B is our focus. That is where most of our uh, you know, business lies. As to the first question, our technology is intended to integrate address data with sensor data. That is one of the important aspects about it. And as to the value and responsibility and you know, the true nature of the data, this is something that I think business people have to sit down with the technologists and really get a handle around. If you're going to base a huge million dollar decision based on the recommendations of a you know, tool, you, you better have some real judgment that goes into weighing that decision. You know, because this is still ultimately a business decision. You can't say predictive analytics made me do it, the IoT made me do it. You know, if, if somebody has to see the business side has to stand behind it. The question comes out from the fact that uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uptake for IoT analytics and lots of companies are buying it. You know, they're investing deep into platforms and these are expensive platforms. So, um, what is then the ROI? So, do they really think once they have an analytics system in place with, which is which is churning out data or information from them? And, and you've been working with them for such a long time. Well, what what is uh, the industry coming to right now with, with the ROI and such? Yeah, I mean it's hard to make a very generic comment. Maybe the gentleman from Oracle. Oracle can, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll let him take yeah. this one. For, for us, it comes down to we always do pilot projects, validate a little bit, then do a little more. Yeah. We never take on big platform things because, you know, in our, we, we operate with mid-sized businesses. They don't have the budgets to just go out and get platforms. In terms, in terms of ROI, just to real quickly, in terms of ROI, I just follow up on this one said is yes. We're going to do pilots, we're going to do POCs, and you're going to start small, and you're going to do quick wins. There's uh, a number of things I could go into in terms of finding value from IoT. Uh, I didn't want to get too technical and get into fast data, but in terms of managing, there's end-to-end, -to -end, right? Machine-to-machine -machine information. There's what we call, what I call swarm. There's, okay, things are moving around, there's assets, there's people. How do we optimize that? And then there's organic and biologic. So, okay, performance of plant, animal, or human being. Can we optimize all three? Build a pattern, depending on where people are moving in an amusement park or a stadium, where the machines are working, what the heat and temperature is that's going to affect that. When you apply it to all of those three, and then you expose it to specific business objectives, you get your ROI. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Cynthia, sorry, I know you have your hand up, but the wall came up on us. But. Thank you everyone, thanks to our panel.